2012 was one of the most prolific years for RPG Maker Horror. If you hear about a popular RPG Maker Horror game, there's an absurdly high chance that it came out in 2012. Heck, both this game and the one that inspired it came out in 2012 and turned into multimedia franchises. Today, we're talking about The Witch's House. The plot synopsis is as follows. The young Viola visits a mysterious house in the woods. She soon discovers its dangerous nature and must find a way out. But the house is ever-changing, and death could be lurking anywhere. This is barely more information than when I covered off. I'm very intrigued by the concept of the house being ever-changing, as this could create some cool puzzles. I'm playing the original version of the game, not the remake, so expect some possible differences if you've played the other version. There's not really much else to discuss, so let's begin. Viola is a 13-year-old girl who went out to play in the woods. There's a mysterious talking cat nearby that functions as a save point. Both directions Viola can go are blocked off by masses of roses, but she locates a machete in the woods and tries it on the flowers. The roses on the lower path are so strong that the machete doesn't even make a dent, but the ones on the higher path have no such issue. Well, there is one issue, actually. Your machete somehow breaks after you cut them down. Viola walks inside the house with no other place to go. There's a singular door inside, so she walks through. So this is one of those games. Unfortunately, yes, The Witch's House is a game where if you sneeze in the wrong direction, you will die. I thought I would never have to see something like this again after Alone in the Dark, but I was clearly wrong. You can die from looking at clocks, answering questions, and just walking around normally. If there are particularly irritating ones, I'll mention them, but for the sake of your sanity, I'll skip over as many as I can, because there are a lot of them. On attempt two, Viola walks around the pool of blood in the center of the room and looks at a note on the wall reading, Come to my room. After leaving the pseudo-trash compactor, the cat from the woods endears himself to the player. Viola explores an assortment of rooms. One has a pair of scissors chained to a desk near a locked door. Another has a witch's diary, a teddy bear, and a closet telling us to return once the house has returned to normal. The diary has an entry depicting the owner of the house, a witch, explaining that she is sick and that her parents don't love her. Finally, there's a room with a basket and a teddy teddy bear inside. A note on the wall instructs Viola to put the second bear in the basket, but it doesn't fit because of its limbs, so she uses the scissors to turn this teddy bear into a torso bear. Concerningly enough, it bleeds during this process. On the way out the door, a bloody paw print appears on the wall. Scares like this are commonplace in the game. They aren't really all that startling after the first couple of times, so it feels like a waste. Another example of scares like this is a young, purple-haired girl. She appears on occasion just walking through the halls but not doing anything. I'm sure a few of you even saw her in the room where we first died. Viola places the bare torso into the basket and leaves after hearing a door unlock. Maybe it's the locked door from the scissor room. Oh no 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 no. So that's our introduction to chases in this game. This one was really effective. It came out of nowhere, it fully made me panic, but I still had a chance to run away and live if my inputs were precise enough. This game does have some weird controls though. Unlike most RPG Maker games, you can move diagonally. This gives you more maneuverability, but it also takes some serious getting used to after playing things like The Crooked Man. For some reason, the bear just disappears. That's one of the biggest problems I have with these chases. A lot of the time, all you have to do is exit and re-enter the room for things to be safe again. There's also the issue of some of the chase spawns being unfair, but I'll cover those in more detail as they come along. The door has now opened up and the main portion of the game has begun, exploring different parts of the house and doing some very weird puzzles. I like the one in the kitchen. You read that silver eating utensils were originally used for multiple purposes, one of which being that they changed color when interacting with certain poisons. You use a silver key given to you by a ghost to test if a soup is poisoned or not. This unlocks a door nearby. That's one thing that you'll have to adjust to. There aren't any logical ways to open doors. You just need to solve any puzzle you can, no matter how random it is, with the hope that it will unlock a door to allow you to progress. Viola moves upstairs through the kitchen. She reads a note in a nearby room stating that the spider cannot tell colors apart. There's a butterfly on a nearby web, but if you grab it, you die. An inconspicuous and definitely not at all alive armor stand guards the hallway next to our feline friend. There are two more rooms nearby, a library and some kind of display room. Viola gets a book of death from a ghost in the library, which is aptly named if you read it. 
Some of the books on the shelves explain the concepts of puzzles unlocking new areas of the house and that the house is constantly changing because of the witch's magic. Another book in the back details the story of a seven-year-old girl's family that died in a house fire. Well, they were found dead after their house burned down, but the fire isn't what killed them. That would probably be the stab wounds. Their daughter Ellen has been missing since the incident. The armor stand in the hallway is doing exactly what we all expected, so Viola moves to the display room where a nearby bookshelf has an open slot for the Book of Death. Another chase occurs, but this one is less scary because it's literally just a PNG of a skull. After re-entering the room, because logic prevails in the witch's house, Viola grabs a model butterfly from one of the display cases and swaps it out with the real butterfly stuck in the spider's web. It flies away and a door can be heard unlocking. On the third floor, Viola meets a little frog friend that helps her activate a precariously placed switch, allowing progression to the next area. There's a room where you have to make both sides mirrors of each other to move on. You even get to use your new little frog buddy. This reveals a room with a new diary entry. The witch claims her parents didn't love her, so she X'd them. Like the letter X. She's been in the house ever since. A note on the wall tells Viola not to let anything distract her in the next room, so she walks straight to the next door without interacting with anything. There's even a fake knife that flies through the air that she just has to ignore as it sails straight for her. The next room shows a locked door with some kind of monster inside. The only information Viola has is a note on the door stating he's hungry. There's no way in hell she's opening that door. After looking through a small window in the door, a monster's scales are visible. The only way to progress is for her to force her frog through the window to feed it, which is horrible. The room is now empty and Viola passes through. The frog appeared for a split second in the room as we were leaving, so Viola trudges back inside to go get her friend. Okay, never mind, not doing that, nope, no. A sign tells Viola to go where only one eye is open. The wall is covered in these creepy faces that seem to act like doors. None of them have only one eye open, so Viola inspects the wall in between two of the faces, one with open eyes and one with closed eyes. This reveals a hidden passage. The passage leads to one of the more frustrating puzzles in the game. Viola needs to make sound in four rooms. There's a room with a piano, one with a clock, one with a music box, and one with pumpkins. Let me preface this by saying if you do anything wrong during this entire explanation, you die. This includes examining seemingly innocuous objects. Viola goes to the piano room, but does not play the piano. She reads instructions in a book telling her about different eye and hair color combinations. The pumpkin room has an assortment of paintings on the wall, as well as a note claiming that blue eyes see the score. According to the piano room's book, the only person in the paintings that could have blue eyes is the one with black hair. Viola follows said painting's gaze and finds sheet music in the wall. The painting comes to life, but all doors are now locked, unlike every other chase in the game. So Viola has to interact with the now empty painting in order to halt the chase. She knocks on one of the pumpkins over and over again until the northern door unlocks, leading to a room with a clock. There's a riddle that when answered correctly nets her the queen key. Viola puts the sheet music on the piano, but doesn't play it, allowing the piano to play itself. She now has the king key. Viola moves to the music box room and plays the box with the queen key. She uses the king key in the clock room, playing the final sound and allowing progression. This puzzle is cool in concept, and I can definitely appreciate the creativity behind it, but it's also ruined by the game's tendency to add dozens of ways to die with no ways of avoiding it other than trial and error. Usually puzzles should build upon each other, and teach you the mechanics of the game that you can use later on in more interesting ways, but this one just changes the rules of chases completely. Viola moves to the next room, meeting the crying statue of a woman looking for her ring. After taking a trip down a chimney and returning to the kitchen area, the ring is located inside of a pot and it's now safe to move on. Well, for the most part at least. There was a five second countdown when moving from the kitchen to the fireplace after acquiring the ring that I wasn't feeling ballsy enough to investigate further. Moving on to the fifth and final floor, Viola is attacked by a creature jumping through the window, but is saved by the purple-haired girl. She moves to the next room and matches dolls to their podiums by color, although one doll is missing. The following rooms are full of sentient plants that act in different ways. The yellow ones gossip, the white one emits light, and the red ones can only lie. Throughout this floor, Viola finds skulls littered about. These have no negative effect on her, but the nearby clock? That's obviously the most dangerous item in the room and should result in an instant death. The yellow flowers have a proposition. They want the white flower to be X'd because they're jealous. In exchange for a prize, of course. Viola tries to ask the red grass what the heck that even means. 
She heard the term used in the diary earlier, but there wasn't much of an explanation. Common sense says that it means killed, which the red grass confirms once you decode their lies. This means we can infer that the tragedy documented in the library was probably talking about the witch, since she's the only other person we know that killed her own parents. Speaking of the witch, there's another diary in the room with the yellow flowers. This one is more menacing than the others. The text is blood red. Then a girl came over to play, a cute girl with golden braids. This has to be Viola. Viola kills the white flower and receives a white powder from the yellow flowers. There's a prisoner in the cell to the right who asks Viola if she has medicine, prompting her to give him the powder. He becomes agitated since he seems to not be able to use it without the use of another object. He slams the wall, knocking a cage over and freeing something invisible. A northern room is now open, but Viola can only be inside for about 15 seconds at a time due to some kind of poison in the air. She finds an empty bottle in one of the skulls. There's another section of this room that's inaccessible because of an unidentifiable substance on the floor. By this point, she had four skulls and could go to a room north of the prison cells to solve a puzzle. After doing so, there is another abrupt skull PNG chase. This one's sprite is animated, so it's more visually interesting, but the use of photos instead of drawing still doesn't fit with the style of the game. Solving the last puzzle resulted in Viola gaining access to a water source. She fills the empty bottle with water and adds the white flower's petals into the mixture to create a pseudo-lantern. It's time to save our game before heading to a room that was previously off-limits due to it being pitch dark inside. The reason I recommend you save is because there are quite a few items in this room that will result in your instant death if you pick them up. As far as I can tell, there isn't a way to tell it apart from the object you actually need, which is a jade pipe. This pipe is the other item the imprisoned man needed to use his white powder. Oh, okay. I'm, uh, I'm not an expert, but I do believe we just got drugs from those yellow flowers. The cell to the left opens up, revealing a pair of shoes that are soaked in blood. Viola washes them off in the pool from earlier and tries to get to the save point before immediately being decimated by another skull PNG. Look where that skull spawned while Viola was moving at a normal walking speed. How the heck was she supposed to avoid that without knowing what was coming? With the newly cleaned shoes equipped, the poisonous room's floor can be traversed. On the other side, Viola's kitty companion asks what she thinks a friend is, which is a somewhat odd question. The diary in this room directly relates to this line of thinking. The witch did not ex Viola because she would save her from her sickness, so she made Viola her friend. Viola moves to a storage room full of bottles. After picking one up, a doll's head crashes through the window. Upon examination of this oddity, we're treated to yet another unpredictable instant death. I am getting really sick of these. This time, Viola picks up the doll head from the southern half of the room so that she has space to run from the eye monsters that killed her last time. The cat has disappeared. The poison room is now completely safe, so Viola explores it further, finding a headless doll. When combined with the head from the eye room, we have the final doll needed for the pedestal room from earlier. Viola places the doll on the pedestal, revealing a hidden passageway to the last segment of the house. Let this be your final spoiler warning for the game. Use the timestamp on screen and in the description if you'd like to skip ahead. Viola walks down a well-lit corridor, contrasting the rest of the house. The lifeless body of a familiar black cat lays between her and the final door. She enters the room, the final diary set on the desk in front of her. The witch's sickness is lethal, so she made a choice. She'll take her body, living on within it. Because they're friends, there shouldn't be any problem. Friends help out friends, right Viola? The purple-haired girl appears to Viola's left, this time without her normal translucence. As she gets closer, it becomes apparent that she has no legs and is profusely bleeding out. She's very well-spoken, giving us lines including ga, Ugh, and Gooch. The girl initiates a chase, being quite nimble for someone without legs. Viola manages to weave her way through the moving furniture and crumbling floorboards, escaping to the forest and finding a note from her father. He apologizes for getting mad at her, explaining that he's just concerned about the rumors of a witch that kidnaps children living in the woods. He worries whenever Viola goes to her friend's house who lives nearby. Her friend, Ellen. That name should sound familiar. It's the name of the girl in the story from the library. The name of the girl that brutally murdered both of her parents. The girl that we believed to be the witch. Viola runs to the thick patch of roses blocking her exit and empties the bottle from the storage room onto it, eradicating them. Her father is on the other side. He'd been searching the entire forest for her, armed and ready to help. Ellen crawls towards them from the house, seemingly begging for help. Two shots later, they leave, safe at last. But of course, the creator had to go and throw a question mark after the word end, didn't they? What I just showed you is referred to as the good ending, 
What we want to see is the true ending. On the first floor, there was a closet with a note telling Viola to return after the house returned to normal. To get this ending, you have to weave back to it during the final chase, grabbing Ellen's knife from within, and then exiting the house. This time, Viola's father doesn't appear right away. Ellen crawls forward, gurgling more unintelligible nonsense. Viola seems oddly calm, calling Ellen stubborn and plunging the knife into her eye. She asks how long Ellen plans on chasing her, claiming that that body won't last long. Viola seems to be able to understand what Ellen is saying. Give it back. Give what back? The body? What does she mean by back? Viola refuses, stating this body hurts much less. Supposedly, Ellen gave it to her in the first place. Do you recall Ellen's diary entry about wanting Viola's body so she could live on within it? This switch took place before the events of the game. The consciousness in that body isn't Ellen, it's Viola. Viola befriended Ellen. She felt sorry for her, not even being able to leave a bed. Viola agreed to let Ellen use her witch's magic to swap bodies, just for a day, so that Ellen could feel normal again one final time before passing on. But Ellen was only manipulating her. After the body swap, Viola gained Ellen's witch's powers and tried to stop her from leaving to no avail. Ellen claims that the house is hers and wouldn't be killing her anytime soon. Viola still clings on to life, desperate to see her father again, worried for his well-being, but she shouldn't be. Ellen will take very good care of him. Viola's father finally makes his entrance, his daughter bleeding out and begging for his help. But his daughter is standing to his left, is she not? The creature in front of him is nothing but a monster. A monster threatening his daughter. A gunshot rings out, then another, just to be sure that the creature won't be coming back. The new Viola and her father leave. I didn't want to interrupt earlier for the sake of the emotional scene, but Ellen said something that I really want to discuss. She said that her house wouldn't be killing her anytime soon. I beg to differ. Before I move on to my closing thoughts, there's a third ending in the game that we should take a look at. This one is somewhat tedious to get. You have to start a new game and not move for an entire hour. You can't have the window sitting on another monitor while doing other work. It has to be your active application. After an hour has passed, the roses will fade away and Ellen will leave the woods. The body Viola was trapped in was in such a damaged state that all Ellen needed to do was wait for Viola to die, causing the magic to fade away. I have really mixed emotions regarding this game. The story started off as just okay without really engaging me, but the true ending tied it all together in the perfect blend of tragedy and despair. I hate what happened, it's unfair what happened, but man does it make for a good story. The gameplay was what knocks the experience down for me. There were some wonderful puzzles scattered about, but there was so much bad game design that I can't fully endorse it. The constant random deaths were infuriating, and the puzzles really started to drag on as the game continued. This is one of the few shorter games I've covered where I had to take a break in the middle of playing it because it was becoming mentally draining. The later puzzles were so convoluted and uninteresting. There weren't any cool mechanics, it was just more of the same thing the entire time. There's a manga series for this game that acts as the prequel, explaining the illness, the house, the traps, the relationship between Ellen and Viola, and lots of other aspects of the story that were never touched in the game. I enjoyed reading it more than I enjoyed playing the game, which makes me wonder what it would be like to see this story in the form of a manga. Finally, let's talk about the remake for a moment. As far as I can tell, there were only a few major changes. They revamped the visuals, but they also added an easy mode and an extra ending. The extra ending isn't possible to attain on easy mode, but I was considering buying the remake to see what it was. Then I found out the requirements for said ending. You can't save a single time on hard mode. With how the game was designed, with all those insane, hard to avoid deaths, that's just not happening. At least not with my level of patience. That's everything I have for The Witch's House. I hope to see you all again. Have a great rest of your day.